Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Express Entry Live Q&A with your host, Mark Holfe here. Thanks so much for tuning in, you guys. It's great to have another round of, uh, of live Q&As. I've got a bunch of other initiatives that are going on here in the firm. Igor and I are working on our study permit applications, the postgrad work permit extension. And we've got a question already from a viewer asking about uh, problems receiving via email. You remember I did a live stream just the other day. Let's flip over here. I'll show you. So I did a live stream. If you go to the YouTube channel and you just click on live, that's where a lot of the good content is. So you can see here, I did a quick video on the 2023 postgrad 18 month extension right here. Um, I don't know if I did that on a Sunday or a Saturday or when I did it. But anyways, we talk about the fact that some people are now receiving this email and I actually show you the actual email notification. Um, but really, April the 6th, tomorrow, is when things start to, to happen. And uh, we should see the program delivery instructions at that stage. And once we receive those, then we'll have a better idea what the world is going to look like. And so you know, let's pull up. Um, we've got um, Sherry. Um, she says, hey, I saw some people receive their email, yes, um, about the postgrad work permit extension since March the 31st. That's true. That's when that email uh, went out. Haven't seen any email and checked all my junk mail, etc. My postgrad work permit expires June 2023. So if for whatever reason you have not received that email, you always, and as of tomorrow, you will see that there should be program delivery instructions on submitting that application. Um, I'm also going to reopen my postgrad uh, 18 month extension course again that we had last year and I have to assume that the minister is not making too many changes to the program other than the fact that if you received your 18 month postgrad last year you can re-up for this year which is a positive development but we'll talk about those program delivery instructions probably tomorrow we'll jump on although my calendar is pretty darn full right now um, uh, with consultations but hopefully we can jump on and if there are uh, details uh, we'll do it just at the end of the day tomorrow We'll, we'll have a live if the minister does indeed announce or release those program delivery instructions, which they're supposed to come out April 6th. So Sherry, there is an ability for you just to apply for it if you don't receive the automated one. And if you do apply and you receive an email or you're el eligible somehow to go through it, um, they will always refund the fee for that postgrad 18 month application that you formally apply for. So keep your eyes peeled for that. All right, Dodome says, hey, Mark, how are you, Santa? And make sure you guys, wherever you're tuning in from, make sure that you please um, let me know. And um, yeah, just, just give me a shout out from wherever you're tuning in. All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, oh, Sahil says, hey, Mark, got an ITA last Wednesday. Oh, I'm going to definitely give yes. that. Oh, it's good. We'll turn off our intro music. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to give a little bit of applause here. For the video. That's what I was looking for, some applause. So we got an ITA last Wednesday. He's applied for police clearance certificate but doesn't have it yet. What should I do? If I don't get it by the end of the 60-day period, does IRCC accept a letter of explanation? Well, understand that that letter of explanation I use for everything that isn't working out the way I want it to. And if you've shown that you've made efforts to submit that request at the beginning of the 60-day period, that's key, Sahil, as, at your earliest opportunity, but yet the processing times are just delayed and taking longer, then you, have, you don't have any choice but to provide all the evidence that you've made the request and uh, that it was outside of your control and that it's not coming back in the 60 days. And yes, you can if you do it correctly. And that is obviously something that I, that I teach in terms of how to structure those letters of explanation, everything. I teach those in my, um, my Canadian Immigration Institute Express Entry course. And a lot of you guys are familiar with that. So there's a link below um, for, for that course, which is actually, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to be doing um, another Express Entry uh, masterclass in about two weeks now. So if I flip my screen over here, I'll show you. You can actually start to register for that right now, which is this course here. Um, the master class is April the 17th to the 20th, and I'm really looking forward. I'm going to be away next week, and then I'll be back right after, and then we will jump right in and uh, have another Express Entry Masterclass. So, Sahil, I recommend that you connect 
uh, and uh, and uh, subscribe to that. And hey, if we have any viewers that have actually taken the course, I'd love to hear from you because uh, the one that we just did last month was phenomenal. I had a great group of people and I love nothing more than teaching. After all, I am a former high school teacher. I was then an immigration officer and then I became a lawyer. In fact, an immigration lawyer is where I focused my time for almost 20 years now. So this is what I love to do. All right, so the question becomes, once again, can you submit a letter of explanation if you do not yet get the police clearance certificate? Yes, it's possible, Sahil, if you do it correctly and uh, if you explain it properly and can fully justify it. Okay, we've got someone who's watching over on the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group. Hello to you. He says, any PNPs inviting NOC 2283 IT test analyst? It is, well, <laughs> that's in the past. Have we seen a NOC 2283? Well, the first thing I'll, I'll tell you is that the, the IT test analyst, the NOC, remember, has changed. So we're no longer using the, the four-digit 2016. We're now using the 2021 tier system. So I'm assuming that's probably still going to be a tier three or a tier two occupation. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, so are there any PNPs inviting? <laughs> I, can't, I can't answer that. I haven't, I haven't scoured through the PNPs, my friend, to search for uh, uh, that particular position. And um, in many cases, the notifications of interest come out and then they announce what they're going to do. So just because they've done something in the past doesn't mean the PNPs are going to redo it again in the future. Even if someone was on an occupation and demand list in the past, doesn't guarantee that it's going to be on the list now. And we don't even know what Minister Fraser is going to do. So what is the minister going to do with the targeted draws? We've had a lot of discussion um, and speculation over the last while. And uh, who knows, is Minister Fraser even going to stay as the Im Minister of Immigration? We've seen a lot of notifications coming out, news releases through his office that don't even relate to immigration. <laughs> so <laughs> it's quite interesting what's happening in the minister's office. So maybe he's moving on to a different portfolio. Who knows? I don't know. But he's worked hard for, uh, for immigration. And uh, yeah, I can't fault the minister too much for, uh, for what he's tried to do to keep things together. Immigration is a brutal portfolio. As far as I'm concerned, um, within cabinet, it is the most difficult, um, uh, yeah, portfolio for a minister to have. All right, let's see what else we've got here. Um, oh, Kathan says that uh, I'm eligible for this 18 month extension, and I got the email from IRCC as well. But my passport's expiring in May 2025. Should I, just one month short of June 2025th, what do I have to do now? Well, you may, Kathan, you may not be eligible. And this is where the program delivery instructions come in because they're very firm on the rules because they want the 18 month to be issued for the full 18 months. And based on, you know, when they, um, you know, when they start to process these, they want to make sure that if they do issue it through the automated process, that they can automatically issue it for 18 months and not some shorter period. Remember, it's all about automation with them. So if they have to actually look at someone's passport and then reduce the number down for a shorter period of time, that's why they have uh, said they want the passports to be valid, um, you know, you know, for that length of period, that length of time um, in, in 2025 to make sure that there's enough time to, to give everybody the 18 months so they don't have to think about the duration and look at passport expiry dates. All about speed, all about automation. So what do you do now? You may not be eligible, Kathan, um, for it. You may not be. Okay. Um, okay, Abud says, hey, I'll be 475. Am I in a good situation? Well, if we look at the rounds of invitations, and boy, has it been crazy or what, you guys? It has been so crazy the last little stretch here. If we go to the express entry rounds of invitations, and I'll refresh it again here. Boy, if you guys see any changes, please let me know. I want to hear about them. But if we go through here, you can see that the, the last no program specified draw was one week ago. And um, who knows? Maybe there's going to be another one today. Maybe the minister's going to extend another 700. But the CRS score was 481. And so if we go up here and look at the number of candidates that were in the pool, actually go down here, you can see that if you're looking at 475, which is what you had indicated, hey, is 475 going to be a good situation? Um, so if you look at that 475 and you take that into consideration, we'll just pop this down a little bit, and then we look at the actual number of people that are in the pool at 475. Well, you can see from 471 to 480, there is, which is all, this has not changed. And in all likelihood, maybe more people have been submitting applications 
in this range, there's over 21,000 people. And so there's still a bunch of people at this level, you know, that, that are, are hanging around. But at 481, as the, as the lowest uh, right here, most of these, and this goes back to uh, just March, um, so just Feb well, it goes back to February 14th of 2023. So anyone who submitted their, their application, their profile after February the 14th, and was 481 didn't get drawn. It's only the people February 14th at this time and earlier received an ITA. So there's still some 481s. In addition to all of these people here, um, probably, I don't know, if, even if we took half of them, there's probably still 10,000 here. So is it possible to go down to 475? Huh, like by, by July, I guess, you know, we're April now, I guess if the minister keeps doing large large draws it's possible that you know it could result in you getting an ita but wow it is um yeah there's just no no guarantees there's no guarantees all we do is speculate here isn't it all right let's see what else we've got here hey d and f hey mark Cartston, alberta very very cool hey you guys Cartston is actually where um the temple is for our church which is really cool i don't know if you guys have ever seen let me just pull it up here because we got some good news on the weekend in our church's general conference that I want to share with you. So let's see if we can, I want to pull this up. <clears throat> so if you're, if you're living in Cardston, you often will have, and I'm going to backtrack here. Uh, this is, I'll just share this images here. We should be able to find one. Yeah. So this here, and I don't know if we can get a better picture. I'll just try to pull it right on. That's probably the best here. So this right here is the temple of our church in Cardston. It's a beautiful temple. And it's about an hour's drive from Lethbridge where I'm at. Well, on the weekend, um, the church headquarters for my church, which is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they, um, they announced that they're going to build a temple in Lethbridge where I live, which is very, very cool. And so, yeah, very cool. Good to have you joining DNF and uh, Carson, Alberta, a fine place. My in-laws live there. Fantastic. All right. Um, okay. Um, Dedome says, my child is U.S. citizen. Shall I apply for her minor study permit to travel with me as a student? Or she is good to go with her passport only? Okay. So if you're applying for, um, uh, if you're, I'm not sure what you're, you said, should I apply to go um, minor study permit to travel with me as a student? Okay. So I don't know what your process is, but if you're applying for anything overseas, I always apply for a study permit. And whether you're a, um, an international student or otherwise, I'll often just include that study permit application in with the parents if it's a visa application. But the one interesting thing is for U.S. citizens, even if you're applying for a study permit, you can do that right at a port of entry. It's one of the only countries where you can do that. So you have those options. <coughs> but I highly recommend, as always, like we always talk about, that you slide over and book a consultation with myself or Alicia here. And you can see the reviews. Um, you can just click on speak to a lawyer. There's a link below and uh, connect with Alicia or I. And we are more than happy to assist you in, um, yeah, in, in resolving exactly what you should do. All right. Good question. Okay. Let's see if I skip through anyone else. Um, uh, okay. So we've got P123 who says, good morning. I have one question. I applied for a visitor record uh, as my post-grad permit was expiring, but then the extension was announced. Will this affect my eligibility to extend my work permit? Well, understand that you have the ability within the new post-grad work permit extension, and we'll get the program delivery instructions tomorrow to, to apply for uh, that, that study permit, or sorry, to apply for that post-grad work permit, even if you've been out of status. So that's one of the neat things about this is if people fall out of status, they are, have abilities to apply for the postgrad. So if you've applied for a visitor, well, you're even in a better situation than those who are in a restorative status. So I don't anticipate there being any issues with that. Okay, let's see what else we've got cooking here. Um, okay, this one is from uh, from Kabawatan. Kabawatan. Maybe. Hey, Mark, can I apply for a visitor visa if my husband, who is inside Canada, who is a permanent resident, since I am refused when he applied uh, me and my son through spousal and parent sponsorship? Okay, this is a huge issue. And this is one also that I'm going to go into my little book of tricks and I'm going to 
click on that bell, which means slide over and book a consultation with us. Um, I need a whole lot more indication of what's going on. Usually in the context of permanent residence, that's where things are going to work out. So if you had, um, uh, if you're refused when he applied for you and your son through a spousal and a parent, uh, parent sponsorship, yeah, like I don't know why that would have been rejected, but I strongly encourage you to book a consult. Um, okay, so Manoj says, I don't think people who applied for the 2022 extension can reapply. Only people who missed the 2022 extension due to technical glitches, not received automated extension, can apply for 2023. We will see, Manoj, how that plays out. In the minister's announcement, he had indicated that those who had uh, participated in the 2022 would be able to extend. And you could be right, Manoj, until we look at it tomorrow, we won't know for certain. But in my mind, if the minister keeps kicking the can down the road like he does, and I don't know how else to describe what the minister is doing other than he's kicking the can down the road, because each time they allow students to push further and further down, why would you not allow students to continue doing if you were not issuing CEC draws that would allow people on post-grad work permits um, who are running out of time to be able to stay? And right now, the way they're structuring the, um, you know, the, the rounds of invitations as no program specified, it leaves a lot of international graduates who are on postgrad work permits without the ability to qualify because their CRS score is not high enough. So I hope that's not the case, Manoj. And, you know, maybe maybe that's it. it maybe he follows the same path as he did um, for the, the 2022 postgrad. But um, my understanding is that that's one of the developments is that people who are currently on that one will be able to apply this year. But we'll see. April the 6th is the is the telling time. Okay. All right. We've got someone. We've got Bright over on LinkedIn. Oh, I'm celebrating that. Let's see. Which one are we going to use? We'll give them some applause here. That is awesome that we have a connection on LinkedIn. Okay. So Bright says, um, please, I applied for my work permit extension since January, but still have not gotten any response from IRCC. Please, what should I do? Bright from BC. Well, Bright, it all comes down to the processing times. And if you look at January, we're April. So we've got January, you've got February, March, April. So if you start at the beginning of January, well, you've got all of January. So still, February 1st, March, April, that's like three months, okay? Three months, three 30, 90 days, okay? So if we look at the, at, and I, every every single time we do a, um, any kind of a, um, uh, a live Q&A, always, always, we end up doing this. So we're going to once again slide over here, share the screen. We're going to pull up IRCC processing times, and let's see what it's at for a work permit, which is, which is yours. So you've indicated that you applied for a work permit extension, and no, we don't care about any surveys. And so if we go here and we look at the work permits, you can see temporary residence. And then we go, which temporary residence in Canada? Well, I'm a work permit inside, initial and an extension. Well, look at the processing times, my friend. 148 days. So you're kind of a little over 90. You're well within the processing times. And so I don't want to tell you, Bright, other than you're kind of on track, just like everybody else. All right. Okay, let's slide back here. Okay, so next... <clears throat> Let's see what we have here. Sita or Sheeta says, postgrad expiring on May 13th. Ah, oh, have a valid TRV till 2030. Can I travel to the US and be back by May 9th, four days before postgrad expiry? Oh, anytime someone has any questions about what I should specifically do, <clears throat> including things that affect a person's status, I ring the bell, say book a consult. Um, but I never would chance um, leaving and re-entering with that little time. I just, I wouldn't. Remember, for, for all intents and purposes, I don't know if you've received your, your email. We don't know what the minister is going to do in terms of actually issuing the, the new post-grad work permits. Technically, technically and legally, can you leave and re-enter? Well, if you have a valid visa and you're, you know, you're traveling to the U.S. and on entry, your post-grad is still valid, well, Technically, you can present yourself to an officer, but it's always up to that officer to decide what they're going to do when you're coming back in. That's the Canada Border Service Agency. So that's why it's really important to um, not expose yourself. And I, I'll be honest, Sheeta, I wouldn't leave unless there's a real valid reason. And that's why I recommend, once again, that you book a consultation and we can talk about this in depth. 
Okay. Um, all right. Ecta says, do we need to list paid vacation three weeks as unemployment in personal history section post ITA? <gasps> Ecta, this is something that we cover at length in this course right here. We talk about it all the time and we advise our clients all the time uh, when it comes to vacations. So here's the simple response. IRCC has consistently told us that Paid vacation is not considered to be unemployed and can be continued as continuous employment. Part of the expectation for employment law in Canada and across all the provinces that are administered individually by their own employment standards codes um, is that people should be entitled to, by statute, vacation. And usually it kicks in, it kicks in for most places after you've completed one year of work. So to have a three-week paid, 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 paid vacation... Um, can absolutely be included as work experience within the context of your application. It is does not need to be separated out and listed as unemployment. However, please, please remember that um, uh, that you you like everything else needs to fit. You need to show that you truly have been working for the the, the full time. But uh, yeah, they've consistently told <coughs> told us that <coughs> paid um, vacations are not to be considered as unemployment, they count. But if it's an unpaid, then I never count that, ever, ever, Ecta. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, P123, she says, my visitor, or he says, my visitor record application is in process. Will this affect my eligibility? No, it should not. No, you should be just fine. You're going to notify them that you have a visitor application in the queue, but, um, <clears throat> but ultimately, it's, it shouldn't affect. Okay. Okay, uh, Shanaz asks a good question. Good morning, Mark. Can I travel to my home country after the ITA, after submitting the documents, and then come back to Canada? I'm assuming after filing your EAPR is what you're saying here, I'm assuming. And then come back to Canada before PR as I have a work permit valid till 2025. Will I need to renew PCC? Okay, so Shanaz, once you've submitted your EAPR, then everything pretty much locks in. IRCC can always come back and ask you for updated police clearance certificates. They can. If you're drawn under one of the programs that allows for you to, to leave and, and re-enter and, and you're not tied to Canada, for example, in the context of, say, a job offer or something like that, that's a part of your application. If you are, based on your assessment of your situation, eligible to, you know, to, to leave Canada, um, as far as the question of uh, will I need a re to renew a PCC, once you file your EAPR, it locks in, all right? Now, I can't speak to any of the other stuff, like you leaving and the effect it might have on your PR application. Um, yeah, I can't speak to any of that because I just don't have the details. Uh, once again, the consult's available for, for guidance, but I wouldn't make any big decision like that. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, like I said, the course, I strongly, strongly encourage you guys to connect in and take the course in, in, with me. We cover every single thing. And I'll be honest, I'm glad I didn't start rolling over um, the, the, the new videos that I'm putting together for the strategic draws, the targeted draws, because we just haven't seen them yet. And it looks like no, it's not going to be even maybe till the, uh, to the, uh, the beginning of the summer when they're going to change. So I'd love to have you join me in the course and, and the masterclass every evening um, for one hour, April 17th to the 20th. I go live where I answer specific questions, Shinaz. So consider joining me over there. Okay. Um, Sana says, hey Mark, my question is with RCC calculating funds in two of my accounts, account A plus account B, when I have provided detailed statements of both of these bank accounts. Yeah, you can, um, <clears throat> they will add it together. Yes, if the accounts, yeah, you can provide it in more than one account, Sana. It doesn't need to be in just one. But like I said, in my course, I teach my students how to draft letters um, of explanation that I call my document specific LOEs and I would include that within your study history or sorry within your proof of funds just to outline for the officer how the two accounts together formulate sufficient for the proof of funds requirement um, yeah so and any questions like I said you guys have don't hesitate to book consults okay <clears throat> Hector says I know you're a busy man but don't forget about the video from your time as a border agent We'll love to know your perspective from both sides of the field. I don't even know if I have, um, let's see. Uh, I don't even know if I have, I probably don't. I'm looking to see if I have any 
that actual picture um, of me on the border ah, in, in my in my officer uniform. I showed it to you guys a while back, didn't I? But it's been it's been so long. Um, let's see here. And let's see. Let's see if I can find an old PowerPoint. Express entry webinar. It's probably in that. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, I think this is it. Maybe I can pull it up. Let's see. None of you probably didn't realize that I was actually, well, I've told you repeatedly, but some of you are probably new and don't realize that uh, that I actually was an immigration officer. So let's see. I created this one a while back. Let's see if I can find it. A picture. And I will steal it and pull it over. Oh, there I am right here. Okay, let's just take a quick snapshot and then I'll I'll share it with you. There we go there. And we'll close that and then I'll drag it over. You guys will get a kick out of this. So there's young Mark Holthy. <laughs> there's me. That's at the uh, Chief Mountain Port of Entry. So right where that stop sign is there, um, you can see the, the stop sign on the right. That was my office, that little office with the windows right on the right. And I was the immigration officer. And so people that were coming from Glacier National Park into Waterton, um, I was the only one there as a, as a young summer student. I was, I'd completed one year of law school at that stage. And uh, you can see my fancy little badge there and everything. And so, um, yeah, I was, I was an immigration officer. It was even before they merged and created the Canada Border Service Agency. So the customs officers, they would go out and they would do the searches and seizures. And if they had someone that had immigration related issues, they would send them to me and then I would deal with them. And so that was right up near Waterton National Park. It was a wonderful, wonderful time that I spent there. Lots of fun and uh, memories that I'll, yeah, I'll treasure forever. And to be honest, you guys, um, the, the reality is that that experience really made the determination of why I wanted to be an immigration lawyer now. And, you know, 20 years later, literally 2020, it's been 21 years later, um, it, it dictated the whole future of my of my life for me and my family. And uh, so, yeah, I should probably <laughs> I need to do that, don't I, Hector? You're busy, man. But don't forget about the video from your time as a border agent. We'll love to know your perspective from both sides of the field. And it's colored everything that I do, you guys, everything. It's been a significant uh, component to you know, how I practice, the, the ethics, the morals, the, you know, how I, I, I advocate for my clients all comes from that time when I was, I was that young border officer working on the border. And um, yeah, so I know ports of entry, you guys, I know ports of entry. But then while I was going through law school, I actually had a, a period of time where um, I worked as a, a pro bono student for the hearings officers. And they're the ones who who represent the minister in immigration appeals. And so during that period of time, I worked with them when I was, a, a, um, just when I was completing my law degree. And uh, let's see here. I've got a few pictures as a, uh, it was right before this. Actually, I'll show you guys this one too. Why not? We're taking, we're taking trips down uh, memory lane here. This is a a slide, a clip that I'm pulling out from um, an old webinar that I used to do for the, my podcast. Anyway, so this here you can see, actually, let's see if I can pull this up. There we go. Okay, so on this screen, you can see this is when I was officially sworn in as a lawyer in Calgary. And so there's, that's what I had when I went through law school. <clears throat> Little Connor was born, um, uh, he was born after, uh, just before my last year of law school. He's the little blonde kid. And Connor is actually down in Chile right now serving a mission for our church. He'll be coming back. He's, he's, he's 19 years old, Connor is. And you can see uh, there's Jessica and Adam. Adam actually, he speaks Dutch. So Adam's the little mushroom, the, the one standing there in the blue shirt. And then my wife, Deanna, there with me. And then the other lawyer is the lawyer who supported my articles. And, uh, and then, of course, on the left is the whole reason I'm doing what I'm doing. In addition to my family, it's, it's my mother. And uh, she was a widow. My father died on the farm when we were um, just, young, uh, just young kids. And, um, yeah, and my mom has been a widow since 1989. And uh, I wanted to become a lawyer to help support her and provide for her. And, and uh, so... And that's part of the reason I live in Lethbridge and I practice immigration law in Lethbridge. It's because of my mom who lives here to help her and support her. So I have one more little Michaela is the youngest and she's uh, 
Um, I don't have her in this picture because she was just a thought. <laughs> but she, my youngest now, you guys, is like months away, April, May, June, two months away from graduating. And then all of my kids will be graduated. Um, they're just awesome. I'm so proud of all of them. And they wouldn't be where they were today if it wasn't for my wife. So there you go. A little bit of a background, but hey, we're all always so stuffy on these things. And I've kind of gotten away from talking about myself and, and the things that mean, you know, that are important to me that have formulated who I am today as a lawyer and as a person and why I even do all these, you know, these live Q&As consistently for how many years have I done this? I guess almost five years. So thanks, Hector. I will definitely get to it. But you're right. I am a very busy man. If I showed you guys my calendar tomorrow, oh my goodness. Yes, I have, um, <clears throat> tomorrow I have, uh, I have a, a 15 minute break right before Alicia and I do our live stream. And other than that, I go all the way from uh, 9 a.m. in the morning doing reviews and consultations, um, post on boarding calls when people hire us. Um, you know, uh, that's the next step after they retain us is to, kind of do a little discussion about how we work together and and then obviously reviews which I have so all the way to 4 30 so I actually have no <laughs> at 11 30 I have 15 minutes to get something to eat and other than that it's all day but that's what happens you know I'm hoping to get away next week and there won't be a live stream next week because I'm going to be away I'm taking my mother way up into northern Alberta to see my uncle who's 81 years old my dad's brother she hasn't been up there for so many years and we're really excited to go up there and see family all right, there you go. So <laughs> that's what's going on for Mark here, the Canadian immigration lawyer, the family man, the uh, the, the 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 person of faith, I guess, uh, Christian, all those kinds of things that, you know, cause me to be what I am today. Okay, Anas says, does the officer assess against MEC for FSW at time of invitation issued or EAPR? EAPR is when they do it, but it's a combination because if at the EAPR stage there have been changes from the time in which you submitted your, um, when you received your ITA, that would cause you to no longer meet the MECs or eligibility, then they can reject it. So continuing on, if someone has 11 months of work experience at an ITA, but 12 months at EAPR, will application be rejected? And that's, once again, I strongly encourage that you guys slide over and you subscribe to the course or join us over here about us, our team, look at our approach, and hire us to help review your application together with you. It's direct lawyer to client collaboration. This is what we love. This is what we do all the time. And we avoid all of these uncertainty and questions that people have exactly like yours and ask because you can't afford to get it wrong. Now, I will tell you generally speaking, and I don't want to give anyone specific advice um, without knowing all the facts, but IRCC, if you are drawn early, and remember, and this is the question I always have for people because when you submitted your application, some people try to do their profile as soon as possible in a way where they're answering the, the, the questions on the eligibility. Do you know what? I'm going to show you. Okay, short answer and ask is yes, you can save it. Yes, if you wait until you've met the one year and then submit your EAPR, in most cases, you will be fine if you do it correctly. But I want to share with you guys, I'm, once again, another teaching moment. I love to teach. A former high school teacher, I absolutely love to teach. And um, actually, that brings up another thing, which I, I, won't, I won't get into too much. But uh, <laughs> this here, I'll show you one other little piece of, of my story here. This, let's see if you can, you guys will see it in a second here as I share my, as I share my screen. I'll pull this up here. One other little image here. I was, before I did all of this, I was a high school teacher. And there's a little snapshot of me when I was doing, this was actually when I was doing my student teaching in university. I can't remember what I was teaching here, but um, this was right when I was uh, just completing my, um, my education degree. And so, yeah, there we go. So that's another, another little piece of my history in my life. But back to what we were talking about right now. What I want to do is I want to slide over here because I want to pull up this and it's called, let's see, I think we can do a come to Canada tool. This should give me the ability. Um, let's go here, immigrate. Let's see if this takes us here. 
extend your stay. Okay, here, this one. This should work. I think this is the one. Okay, yes. So this should be very similar to your the eligibility assessment that you do after you create your GC key. And then you say, I want to immigrate. And you go through the eligibility to submit your express entry profile. This is the similar type of thing. So when people run into the situation like we have here, where, um, where Anas is talking about, hey, what happens if I only have 11 months when I get my ITA, um, but 12 months after EAPR, will the application be rejected? Well, here's something that no one talks about, but hey, that's what I do. I guess I'm the only one who's talking about these things. When you look through here, you can see it gives you instructions. It says it needs to take you about 10 to 15 minutes. We're going to do it in like two minutes here. Um, it says based on your answers, they'll tell you if you're eligible for express entry. Okay, so if we check eligibility, and this is the same kind of questions that you're going to get when you go through your eligibility assessment in your GC key. If you do not know yet, choose the province or territory. So what province do you plan to live in? Of course, you guys are all moving to Alberta. Absolutely. So there's Alberta. And then find out if you're eligible. Canada's official language. We'll say, oh, made in Canada. We'll say you wrote the CELPIP test. And when did you write it? Oh, I just wrote it because we want it to be within two years. Otherwise, it'll say I'm ineligible. Then the scores, oh, I'm a rocket scientist. Well, I'm a, I'm a linguistic expert. I've got 12 and everything. Then we'll flip down more. Do you have any other languages? No, not at this time. That's all I need. I'm just trying to qualify for CEC. Now, here's the key, okay? In the last three years, how many years of skilled work experience do you have in Canada? It must have been full-time or an equal amount of part-time. So right here, none, less than a year, one year or more. So how do you get a profile submitted unless you misrepresent this question? So people who have not yet reached one year, when they're filling in their, you know, their information, um, you know, they're, they're, they're going to they're gonna get a, a comment that they're ineligible. So if I put less than one year here, and then if you don't have Canadian work experience, put none of the above. So put none of the above. So let's see if I put less than one year, and then I advance here. It says, now it's trying to say, okay, this person doesn't meet CEC. Do they meet FSW? So once again, how in the last year, the last 10 years, how many years of skilled work experience do you have? So if I put less than one year outside Canada, and then I put here none, and then I click next, guess what happens? Boom, you do not appear to be eligible. So either way, some people may have, okay, and this is where I, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. Some people may have foreign work experience, but what they don't have is um, the Canadian experience. So they can get into the pool. We'll go back here to the beginning again. So you can get into the pool through your FSW eligibility, but then the system automatically counts your 12 months um, because of how it rounds up. So if we go through here once again, and we go Alberta, and then we'll jump a little bit more here. Official language, once again, we'll just put self up in again. Next, and it won't take long here to whip this off. So 2023, January the 1st, throw that down there, and then throw some scores quickly. Doesn't matter what they are, because they're all gonna be high enough. And then we get to here, none, no other languages. And then the last piece right here, if we say we have one year or more, and it's at a tier three or higher, then we should get eligibility. Moment of truth. It's thinking. It's thinking, you guys. Oh, brilliant. See? To apply online, you need the personal reference code. Okay? So it may be that someone answered the questions in such a way that they met the, the federal skilled worker eligibility. But I am always curious with people if they have no foreign work experience. Well, at some point in time, you have to fib a little bit um, to, to get the system to allow you to enter your profile if you don't have that one year of experience. Now, what Anas is really getting at is the fact that when you enter your work history, once again, what we teach in the course and what we clarify for our clients, when you enter your work history, it only asks the month and the year. So technically speaking, if you were to say you started your work, let's take April, okay? So let's say you started work last year and you started May 30th, okay? It's going to give you credit for all of May. And then if you say, well, if you say May of 2022, and then you say it's your current position, it's going to give you credit for April. But we've just started April. So in, a, in essence, <clears throat> you will have only worked a little over 10 months, but the system could accept you in the pool and grant you an ITA with 
with only a little over 10 months of actual work experience because they give you credit for all of May of last year, even though you only worked one day in May, and all of April, well, at least even though April hasn't even concluded. So it's entirely possible that this happens. And if you do it correctly and ask, if you create your profile, if you um, if you uh, explain in a letter of explanation properly, you're not going to have an issue. You can work your way through it. All right. Great question. Wow. That was a pretty big teaching moment here. OK, um, let's see what else we have here. Um, OK, Troll says standing at 41 did not receive it in the ITA and FSW due to tiebreaker. Oh, my heart breaks for you. I wish I had a, a sad one. Maybe this one. Yeah, maybe that works. Um, did not receive an ITA and FSW due to a tiebreaker. Expecting ONP, Tech, PNP also. But will it be below 480 since EE cutoff was 41? It's possible. Like, you, you, we just don't know. Um, usually when it comes to the OINP and the other PNPs, they usually have kind of a slot limit that fits just below where the rounds of invitations are occurring. And uh, so we just don't know. So unfortunately, Troll, there's not going to be, uh, like, I can't give you any real substantial guidance on that. Um, it, anything's possible. Okay, uh, Syed says, hey, Mark, will the open-ended employer letter required post- I complete my CC experience on a closed work permit with the same employer to claim 50 CRS points. Side, book a consult on that one. I know what you're asking. So Side's asking, he says, okay, I've got CC, but I've got a job offer. Um, I'm assuming it's closed, so it's employer specific. So he's getting the 50 points. Can he switch to a bridge? That's the question, okay? And, and the short answer is maybe, but we need to look at this. We need to look at the more detailed. So I recommend Side that you book a consult slide over and yeah, slide over right over here. There's a, a link in the description below and book a consult and we can, we can chat about it. All right. Okay. Let's keep zipping through here. We're covering good ground. And like I said, today is an unbelievably busy day. So right after I finish the live right now, I have another call. Oh, let's see here right at 11. So we shall see how this plays out. 11 and then I have another meeting at noon and then another meeting at 1 and then I wrap up with a consult at 2.30 and another meeting at, yeah, at from 2.30 to 3. So, ah, crazy day. <clears throat> That's all right. This is the highlight. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is the highlight, you guys. Okay, let's see. Um, Okay, Ersine says, I'm waiting for an LMIA supported job offer from my current employer. Is it okay to add LMIA to my Express Entry profile and receive an invite before receiving the LMIA, hoping to get it soon? No, you don't want to do that until you're actually eligible, right? You don't want to do that. Okay, um, <laughs> Raya says, hey, Mark, could you focus more today's program delivery update about dual intent? Hey, this is Express Entry Q&A is what this one is all driven about. I recommend, Raya, that you jump on to the live that I'm doing with Alicia tomorrow and then we can dive in a little bit more to dual intent. But the reality is it depends on the context. You know, it's a whole video in and of itself talking about dual intent. But essentially, the concept is this. Immigration needs to determine the bona fides when anyone applies for a temporary entry to Canada. You know, basically, will they return back to their home country if they're granted a visitor a study permit or a work permit? So that temporary intent is an essential component. But what happens when you have someone who applies for permanent residence but also applies for temporary entry as a worker or a student, for example. You know, how can you show temporary intent and permanent intent, in other words, you want to be a permanent residence, at the same time? How do they work? Well, on the U.S. side, there's a presumption of immigrant intent. So there is no dual intent. If you have any indication that you want to be a permanent resident in the U.S., they'll say, nope, we're not going to grant you temporary because you can't have both at the same time. I know I'm oversimplifying it and I'm not an immigration attorney in the U.S., but generally speaking, <clears throat> that's the, 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 the overarching kind of methodology. In Canada, we have a provision that specifically allows for people to seek temporary entry while still having permanent intent. And um, it's applied unequally across the board. I just had a consult with a, a client who is looking to sponsor his soon-to-be spouse, his fiance, but wants to try to do it from within Canada. And so do they apply for a study permit? Do they apply for a visitor visa? Well, they can't ignore or hide the fact that they have a relationship, you know, an engagement, 
a fiance in Canada, at least generally speaking. And so if you're coming from India, that's almost like you're done because they're jerks. No, I shouldn't say that. It's not nice. They're more difficult in their adjudication, and they tend to refuse those types of applications more frequently than in many other countries, except maybe the African countries. They're even worse. All right. So there you go, Raya. Hmm. Quick little overview. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Ritika. Oh, no. Another express entry one. While creating my profile, <coughs> I need to get a drink here, guys. Just give me a second. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ritika says, while creating my profile, I did not mention um, work experience from previous employer in a different knock. Only claim points for current work experience from 2014 till now. How to show previous work experience. Okay. Ritika, this is fixable. It's not an issue. When you're completing your work history section in your profile, you only need to include the work experience that you're claiming points for. In your EAPR, after you get your ITA, <clears throat> you will then fully disclose all of the work history and everything that you've done for the past 10 years, including that work experience that you didn't in include in your work history section because you didn't want to claim points for it. So it's a relatively simple fix if you do it correctly. And um, yeah, that's short answer. It's possible to, to, to go forward without too many issues there. Ella, hello, good to see you. Okay, um, okay, uh, Plinky, Plinky Pie, <laughs> you guys are hilarious. Plinky Pie says, hey Mark, can I ask regarding the IELTS? If we received our ITA, but the IELTS expired after receiving the ITA, do I need to sit for the IELTS again? Absolutely, yes. The only thing that's locked in is age. So if your IELTS expires before you submit your EAPR, then yeah, you got problems. So you absolutely need to set it again. And I would have advised you if you'd retained me to help you that you should have written, rewritten that test a long time ago. But sometimes people get surprised. They just don't even realize that they have a chance. So, okay. Um, okay, let's see. Catherine, what is your question here? Got to go back. Um, Okay, Catherine's first question was, I'm eligible for 18 months. I got the email from RCC, but my passport is expiring in May, just one month short of June. What do I do now? Okay, so then he says, but what if I renew my passport? Well, the reality is if you renew your passport, you only have a certain period of time to respond. <clears throat> if you get your passport renewed by that time, then theoretically, it could work. Theoretically, theoretically, okay? All right, let's see what we've got next here as I sift down through. We've got, we've got a ton of really, really good questions. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> Tadome says, it's birth tourism. Okay, now the whole picture is sh sorting out. I recommend that you book a consult. Simple as that. Okay, so book a consult and let's chat about that in depth. Um, okay, Ella says, if we aren't claiming points for a particular job, do we have to add in our work history or... We can include it in our personal history. I have worked a few part-time jobs as a full-time student. Absolutely, that's what you're going to do. You're going to um, uh, you're going to make sure. <clears throat> and remember, there's a difference. Sometimes you have to be careful when you put things into your profile and dumped in a whole bunch of work history that you don't need to in the work history section. You have to deal with it carefully when you're removing it and properly explain it to an officer through a properly worded letter of explanation why you've removed it and how it doesn't affect the, the calculation of your eligibility or your um, your uh, comprehensive ranking system score based on section 11.2 of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. And we specifically address that in our course and we work with that when we're working with our clients. So it's possible, yes, um, absolutely you're gonna list everything in personal history. Once I had some clients book a consult because they relied on some helpful friends who had actually gone through the process and got their PR. But their friends said, if you don't listen in your work history, then you don't have to provide reference letters for it. But if you don't list it in your work history, their friends told them, which is wrong, this is wrong, list unemployed in your personal history. Total misrep. Well, the clients got a procedural fairness letter from IRCC saying, did your husband who's 40 years old really not work at all over the last 10 years? It was foreign work experience, right? You don't need, you're not getting any points for a, a spouse's foreign work experience. Well, it almost cost them their future. Now, in fairness, their friends who used that misrepresentative approach, 
they got their PR. The officer didn't catch it, didn't think about it, right? Didn't ask the question. But for them, they were caught. And really, their friend should never have, they should have been found to have misrepresented themselves and have their application rejected. But they did it wrong, got it approved, and then started telling everybody else their strategy. That's what I see a lot of. Instead of relying on law, policy, program delivery instructions, you know, those kinds of things, um, lots of representatives rely on their own experience. So in other words, instead of knowing the law, they say, well, I did this for this client that time. It didn't work. They got their application rejected and their life is destroyed. But I know not to do that again. I see a lot of that. So sad. And mostly it's lazy, um, lazy representatives that don't take the time to actually learn the law. Okay, Jasmine says, hey, if someone is on employment insurance benefit while submitting the PR application, do they have to disclose it in the application or just mention unemployed will work? Unemployed will work. It doesn't matter, really. You're entitled to receiving insurance, um, uh, employment insurance if you've been laid off or otherwise. Okay. Uh, okay, um, Timothy, we see a lot of these refusals. Um, it might be a little out of topic. Yeah, I got a study permit refusal last December all the time, setting issues of financial inability because I didn't have substantial evidence for a bank statement from the sponsor. Yeah, and understand, Timothy, anytime you have a sponsor, it's it's immigration automatically makes life more difficult for you. Automatically, they do. And just for those of you who are not aware, I created a fantastic right here. Oh, there's the postgrad extension course. Igor's got it up already. <clears throat> this study permit course. You guys have to absolutely subscribe to this if you're looking to study. This course is chock full of more things than you guys could imagine. Um, instructions on just about everything. I never really show much about the study permit course. I wonder if I have it in my in my profile here. I can't remember if I have it in all of the past courses that I've created. You guys probably recognize all of these. Um, I don't think I have the study permit linked to me. Okay, I won't worry about it. But basically, remember guys that I have a study permit course. And I strongly, strongly encourage you to subscribe to it because it will help you to avoid all the common pitfalls, including the issues that you're, um, Timothy, that, that you're experiencing um, with the issue proving funds. So strongly encourage you guys to, to, to look at that. Uh, okay, <laughs> Chloe, if a low-skilled LMIA closed work permit processed under international mobility program by the visa office, is that their error? I don't know what you mean by that. Um, like an LMIA is the foreign worker program and the international mobility program is a Dever one. I need a whole lot more information. Okay. Okay, let's see here. Um, okay, Manoj, thank you for your clarification. Yes, and yes, you're right. Yes, I agree with you there. He says if the person got an extension for last year, um, the 18 months should kick in. And so, but understand... Some people, well, it depends on when they issue it. I guess, yeah, I guess you're right, Manoj. It's possible that anyone who um, who uh, received it last year may indeed not be uh, not be needing it because their their work permit will have expired in 2025. Possible. Well, we'll see. Or should, I should say 2024. So, good point, Manoj. All right, but we'll see. Ultimately, tomorrow, April the sixth, we'll have the program delivery instructions, which will hopefully reveal all. Okay, let's see here. We'll go a couple more and then we'll wrap it up. A good point, Manoj. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Uh -huh. Let's see here. <laughs> okay, Nafi, this is, <laughs> this is also one that I would ring the triangle with. Okay, after I get my PR, can I go marry my fiancé a couple weeks after getting the card? Or it's recommended that I wait for six months. Well, ultimately, there are certain evidences, pieces of evidence that they want to um, uh, that they want to see. They want to see that you have a full time job. You know that you're that you're employed, not that you have a full time job, but that you have financial resources to support. You know, in the document checklist, they ask for notices of assessment. They ask for employer letters, and those things are always factors that I look at. But if you are already here in Canada, and you've got your permanent residence, and you've got work experience, and you're working, and you know you've become a permanent resident. Um, you should have all that stuff available. And so there's no real delays. You can, you know, you could marry and get, you could sponsor the next day. And 
okay, what am I going to show you? I'm going to show you guys again these topics we're talking about. Well, guess what I have here? A spousal sponsorship course. So all of this is available. And my goodness, like the, the pitfalls people can avoid by just subscribing and, and, and going through those courses is, yeah. Um, yes, everyone gets it good, but the numbers do. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Thank you, Manoj. Okay. Um, okay. I think uh, uh, Pinky Pinkie Pie, we talked about this a little bit. Received the ITA, but the IELTS expired after I received the IELTS. Do I need to sit for, yeah, we covered that. So yeah, you, you need to you need to get in as quick as you possibly can. There might be a way to, to save this, <clears throat> but understand that your ITA is locked in based on the language scores that are in the system. So boy, you, and you can see it doesn't ask for a copy of your language scores because they're automatically translated. So, uh, so they're automatically uh, transmitted to IRCC. So I strongly encourage that you um, consider booking a consult, letting me help you with that. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, uh, Ritika says, do I need to provide exact addresses from the past 10 years? You need to do everything in your power to make it as correct as possible. And then, if not, a properly worded letter of explanation. Okay, um, let's see what else. Uh, Ekta, you're very welcome. I know I didn't get through everyone. Remember tomorrow, we'll be back at it and you guys will be able to uh, answer questions, get questions answered from Alicia and I. So pay attention to that. Uh, it'll be at noon tomorrow and right here where you're watching this live stream. Anything else here? I'm just looking to see if I can hit on any couple last minute ones. Um, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Dom says young man. Indeed. Indeed. Yes. Uh, oh, now I'm getting to all of your questions. Uh, Mark looks so young as an immigration officer. Yeah, I was. I was young. It was, it was like over 20 years ago, you guys. Um, let's see here. Visit, uh, let's see. <laughs> Santa is doubting that it's me. Uh, of course it's me. Um, yes. Very proud moment, Chloe. Hey, I'm getting to the fun stuff, interacting. You guys post so many questions. So it's, it's, uh, sometimes it's hard to, to get caught up to everybody. Thank you. I love my story. And if you guys saw where I came from, I never showed you that. So my, like some people think, oh, these lawyers are just all rich, entitled people. And, and the reality is if I, if I was to share, I don't even know if I can share this with you guys. Um, it's kind of, uh, let me see if I can, I'm going to try to shift something and I'll finish off with this. I know I've got something else that I'm late for. I've got to get over to, but I want to share my PowerPoint. Let's see. Oh yeah, here you go. Okay. So this is just, this is an old PowerPoint that I created. This is my family. So my father, he passed away on the farm when I was little. Um, well, when I was probably 11, he started having heart problems. And, and so my brother and I, we basically had to run the farm and we had cattle and there's me with my my uh, my Charlay uh, calf at the show, and we were farm kids, and my mom obviously made these nice little cowboy shirts for us. Oops, I went a little bit fast. And so that was a Southern Alberta farm boy. I was heavily involved in sports, you guys. I loved it. So there's me, high jump. My personal best was about 205, 205 centimeters. What is that? It's like six foot eight, six foot nine, and I'm about 5'11". So I loved high jump. I would have totally pursued that, but you can't support a family on... <laughs> being a <laughs> being an Olympic athlete, although I did have the ability to go to the Barcelona Olympic trials, there's me um, uh, for high jump, and you can see I'm short, and all these guys are tall. <laughs> They're all so much taller than me. That was back in 1992. Do you believe how far ago that was? I loved I loved high jump. I loved track, so that was fun. And uh, yeah, and then when I was in college, I uh, there was me. I played volleyball with the local. Uh, Lethbridge College men's team and I was the captain of the team and uh, yeah that was fun and then off I went to high school uh, uh, went to, uh, to to get my teaching degree and then I went to law school at the University of Manitoba and then I became a Canadian immigration officer which changed my whole world and then after I became an immigration uh, after I became a lawyer I focused exclusively on immigration and there's the fam this picture's a little bit older um, they're all old but this little critter right here she's graduating this year Connor is down in um, Chile. Like I said, he's learned to speak Spanish, Santiago. Adam here, when he served his mission for our church, he went to Suriname. Um, and so he speaks Dutch. And, uh, and then my daughter, she actually served a mission in Indiana in the U.S., but she's completing her teaching degree now. Adam wants to be a doctor. Uh, Michaela wants to be a veterinarian. And Connor, we're not sure what he wants to be. We'll find out when he gets home. <laughs> 
So there you go. There's the Holby clan, you guys. There, we'll wrap it up with that. Thanks so much for tuning in. And I do want to give a shout out to um, the sponsor of our podcast. And uh, the podcast sponsor is, um, I'll just uh, pull them up here. Do, do, do. We'll pull this off and then we will uh, bring up, I've got so many different windows here, um, sponsored by Journey Business Plans. And so Journey has been a really good sponsor for us. And if you have not yet listened to the Canadian Immigration Podcast, get over there and listen to it because it is a lot of fun. I'll share one other thing with you here. You can find it. Oh, I guess I got to change this. I got too many things going on on my screen here. I guess what I need is Chrome. There we go. So you'll see it right at the top of the Canadian Immigration Institute page. You can click on podcast or you can go to our firm website and the podcast is right there. And um, the fun part we're doing right now, and I want to challenge you guys, you can watch it, listen to it on whatever. Um, we have <laughs> the return of the impossible trivia, which is the Canadian trivia that covers history, geography, um, culture, Canadian culture, and Canadian immigration. So those four pillars. So there you go. And as always, um, Alicia and I are more than happy to connect with you, uh, book consults, and uh, and ultimately represent you. And you can learn more about it right here through our approach, which we think is pretty awesome. So you haven't checked it out, go do it. Everything starts with a consult. And I would absolutely love to see you guys um, right here looking at me in the exact same fashion in, uh, in an interview, uh, a client you know, consultation, we call them where I can answer any questions you have or Alicia and we can help you and we'd love to help you with your express entry. Um, boy, if I could just reiterate how volatile it is. If I look at all my consults, the vast majority of them are people who've tried to do it on their own. And generally it seems pretty straightforward until they miss one little thing and then it's all over. All right. Thanks so much, you guys. It was great having you here too. And uh, we will wrap it up here with one last comment that I found here. Let's see if I can clear this out. We'll wrap it up with Mike's comment. He's play, he said, I played volleyball too in high school and college. Cool. Nice fellow volleyball player. I actually coached the college team as well. And my son played for the club team down at Brigham University in, uh, in Idaho as well. He likes to play volleyball too. So thanks so much, guys, for joining. And we will see you tomorrow with Alicia. Take care. All the best as you navigate this crazy world that we call